I'm sure you've all had a conversation or two in our lives that didn't go well. One time, I remember doing everything for my boss, running his errands, making him look good in front of his boss. I wasn't his assistant, but I literally did his job. He was going through a tough breakup, so I figured I'd help him out. But then he kept swiping on Tinder again and again and again. And every time he matched, he'd ask me to come in on the weekends because he had dates he had to go to and he needed me to cover his shifts. After about three weeks of this, the constant, hey, I'm terribly sorry, can you cover my shift this weekend and handle these clients for me? I had enough. I yelled at my boss because I was fed up with his shit. I did, however, regret and wished I had handled that better. But again, I didn't read this book at the time, and on some level, he probably did deserve a bit of that. Difficult Conversations by Douglas and Heen teaches readers how to have constructive, respectful, and effective conversations when it's the most difficult to have those conversations. When the stakes are high, when your emotions are very high, and when the last thing you want to do is talk. By the way, side note, we do have a great relationship still. No coworkers were harmed in the making of this review. Let's get started. So what are difficult conversations? Difficult conversations are the conversations we'd rather avoid. They include complaining to a neighbor about their barking dog or asking for a salary increase at work. Let's go over some steps you can take to fix any crucial conversation. Step one, stick to the facts. What happened? The common mistake is to stop at what has happened at a superficial level. What we should do instead is understand what interpretations of those events are and what is important to each party. For a good resolution, the parties involved should move from their views of the fact to a curiosity about the other person's view of the events. For example, Mitch leaves the window open because he's hot and likes fresh air. His brother Anthony hates that he leaves the window open because he hates bugs. He thinks his brother is rude. So the conversation might go like this. Okay, Anthony, does it inconvenience you when I leave the window open? And then he'll say, yes, I hate it. And then you'll say, okay, how do you feel when I leave the window open? Does it make you feel like I'm being rude? From then on, you can then explain that you don't mean to hurt them or inconvenience them so that the conversation can move to two human beings understanding each other. Step two, don't assume. The second common mistake is that people often assume to know what the other party's intentions are. But our assumptions are often wrong because we base them on our own feelings. So if we are hurt, then we tend to believe the other person's intentions was to hurt us. And that's often just not the case. Also, there's a certain tendency of going with the worst possible option, which certainly doesn't help us in any conflict resolution. The simple solution is to ask the other person what was their intent. So Anthony might assume Mitch keeps the window open because he wants to piss him off, when really he's just hot and he needs fresh air. Step three, avoid blame, which can quickly escalate the situation and take us further from any resolution. We should instead focus on finding out how we all contributed to the situation. Telling first our own contributions can help the other person move from the natural tendency of blaming. Here are four common contributions in any difficult conversation. Number one, we avoided it for too long. We often contribute to a problem by avoiding it for too long, allowing it to grow inside of us. Number two, we avoided the person. Behaving in any way that makes it hard to talk to, moving quickly, avoiding eye contact, being generally unfriendly. Number three, we assume righteousness. We all form opinions based on past experiences and references, but there are no right or wrong, just intersections of different needs and personalities. Number four, we assume we're good. We often assign ourselves positive roles in the issue, which is comfortable for us, but not useful. To expand your views on the contribution, try to look at yourself from the other person's shoes, and then look at the whole situation from a third-party perspective. Step four, do share your feelings. Expressing emotions openly is difficult for many of us. We tend to avoid being too open about how we feel. This is dangerous because unexpressed feelings tend to fester, find their ways back into the conversation in nasty ways, and prevent us from listening properly. The solution is for all the parties to share their feelings openly and clearly. Don't mistake them for facts. This is important. But don't pretend that feelings aren't there. Both their feelings and your feelings matter. Step five, detach your identity from the conversation. Some conversations are very tough because they inherently touch our own sense of worth. A job review, for example, or talking about how to fix a big mistake. The most difficult conversations threaten our ego and sense of identity by calling into question our competency or even whether we are worthy of being loved and appreciated. It's human tendency of thinking in terms of all or nothing. That can make the identity level of a conversation so touchy. We tend to think we are either great and everyone loves us, or that we are terrible and unworthy. The solution is adopting the and stance and ditching the all or nothing paradigm. For example, you're not bad because you have done a mistake and 
you can keep interacting and working on things, this will improve. Rather than, you're not bad because you have done a mistake, but you can keep working on things, this will improve. It's a very subtle change, but it's very effective. Step six, letting go. Do you really need the conversation? While many of us tend too often to avoid difficult conversations, sometimes it does indeed make no sense to have the conversation. They suggest working on it on your own. The three levels of conversation and drafting a contribution map without having the difficult conversation. That will give you more insight and will give you also a better idea of whether it makes sense to have a conversation or if it's mostly an issue that you have within yourself only. What's the most difficult conversation you wish you had handled differently? Comment down below. Step seven, tell the story from a third party perspective. They say most people start by describing the issue from their own perspective, which automatically rises the defense barrier from the other party. The best way to go instead is with a third party perspective to describe the issue in a neutral term. This dialogue isn't from your point of view or the other person's. Rather, it should be told as an impartial observer. Suppose you have a roommate who doesn't like to clean their side of the room. Instead of approaching them by saying something like, I'm so frustrated that you never clean up and I have to walk all over your stuff. The third story would be, it seems like we have two different preferences on what our dorm room should look like in terms of cleanliness. When we hold back from passing judgment, there's no need for getting defensive. You can work towards a solution together. Step eight, listening. The key to becoming a good listener is very simple. Be genuinely curious and genuinely concerned about the other party. Ask questions. Ask for examples and paraphrases on what they said to make sure you understand. You cannot move the conversation into a more positive and constructive stage until the other person feels heard and understood. Step nine, express your opinion as legitimate. Each party must understand that their own views and feelings are just their own and there's no right or wrong. So if they think the mess is normal, they are right. And if you think the mess is too much and you hate it, you're also right. It's all about perspective. Step 10, accept that there are some difficult people. The authors point out that the other person likely has not read difficult conversations, so they might remain focused on blaming and arguing who's right or wrong. In this case, we'll use one of the two. There's reframing. For example, this means taking the blame and accusations of the other person and reframing them into more positive terms for the discussion. For example, as contributions. Naming the dynamic. If the other person goes off track, for example, by interrupting or refusing to admitting their own feelings, call attention to that behavior and raise it as a point of discussion. The naming of the dynamic technique will make the other person aware of their own behavior. You could, for example, tell them, look, it's not okay to only look at my contribution. I feel like I'm trying to look at this issue from both perspectives. Is there anything I'm doing that's making it hard for you to look at your own contributions in this situation? Step 11, find common ground solutions. Mutual persuasion. Remember that you both need to agree on the solution and that they have to persuade you as much as you need to persuade them. Ask them what would persuade them and tell them what would persuade you. When the parties cannot find a solution working for both, they must decide on whether to accept a smaller solution, deal with the consequences, or walk away. And that's all for today, I hope this helped. If you got value from this video, like it, and if you have any interesting comments, comment down below. And if you want more videos like this, subscribe and hit that notification bell. If you did feel like supporting this channel in a huge way, there is a link down below to buy me a coffee, which I would love, because that's a fuel I use for these late nights till 4am working on content for you. Thanks for watching, let's continue to move in silence.